Well, hey, everybody, this is Duncan to go the talk show. And uh, we are so excited to be here today, have our first episode with Mike, who is an incredible friend of mine and a dear colleague. And uh, Mike, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I am very excited to be here. Uh, Not only excited to be part of the first podcast, but just to be doing this in general. It's a lot of fun for me. Well, and I know that sounded sarcastic, but I, I meant it genuinely. Thank you. I appreciate you clarifying the genuine sarcastic level. But, you know, I guess the first question out the gate, you know, we're, we're here, we're on set right now, and I am drinking Bow Roasters. But, Mike, how do you take your coffee? Yeah, so I know this is, I know you have a, a thing about, you know, always taking a cup of coffee with somebody. Um, I personally find coffee to be hot dirt water. So I don't take coffee. Now, that's that's I think it runs in my family because my dad and my brother also don't drink coffee, um, so I don't know what it is. Our our f- taste buds are uh, too sensitive. Too sensitive, yeah. Yeah, it makes so. So yeah, I just don't drink coffee. So I'm just tired all the time. So well, that's good. I mean, yeah, do you that's how do I you get around it? Do you supplement like caffeine levels or anything else to keep going? Like, are you a Red Bull guy? Are you uh, you know, like where do you sit there? Yeah, it's interesting. I don't think that caffeine has much of an effect on me. Uh, my family lives in Virginia, so when I go home to see them, it's like a six-hour drive. So I will pack a handful of Red Bulls, and I'm still tired on that whole drive. I think maybe it's just I'm at that point in my life where I'm just always tired all the time. Um, but I will have uh, a caffeinated drink, a soda or something like that, but not in the morning. Morning, it's just, I, I gotta, I gotta work my way through it. And then, uh, after lunch, I'm usually feeling good. Great. Well, so then to follow up on the food question or, yep. you know, kind of caffeine, coffee, mm-hmm, beverages, mm-hmm. if you were a type of pizza, what type of pizza would you be and why? <clears throat> so, um, I think a lot of people misinterpret this question. I think they think, well, I'm, I like this type of pizza, so I would be that. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily just be the type of pizza that I like. So, um, but in this case, I am. Uh, it would be a meat lover's because not only do I love meat, but I'm also uh, I'm chunky and I'm a little salty. So I think, uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's a good balance there. I, I, uh, that's, that's my go-to pizzas and meat lovers. So if you walk into a pizzeria sure. in New York... Are you saying meat lovers across the board or are you being a little specific on what type of meats, you know, are you treating it like arguably yeah. like a charcuterie board mm-hmm. with a, you know, a, a level of mozzarella? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I'll, I'll, I'll see what their meat lovers pizza has on it because like there are some meats that I, that I might like on their own, but maybe not so much on a pizza. So, um, but a lot of them, it's pretty much, it's pretty standard. It's, it's pepperoni. It's your sausage. Maybe it's bacon. It's maybe some salami. Uh, and I'm fine with all that. That's great. I mean, it seems very educated. Yeah. yeah. Like a lot of trial and error has gone. Well, it's important. That. It's yeah. yeah. So now as we've offered the advice yeah. around picking a pizza, what is probably the best advice you've ever received? <sighs> Coming in hot with yes, the uh, you're absolutely right. I, heavy I, questions that uh-huh. I've not prepared for. Um, <clears throat> I think um, so. There's a there's a phrase that you hear on a film set that is um, it's specific to film, but I've sort of um, used it in my life for other things. But essentially, it's the if you're if you're on time, you're late. If you're early, you're on time. I may have misinterpreted that. I think it's if you're early, you're on time. If you're on time, you're late. Um, and so I really like that because it means like don't be late to things. And even if you're just doing the bare minimum, it's it could be better. Um, and so I really like that because I try to do that in my daily life. I try to not settle uh, for just fine, just on time. It's the next iteration, or it is the trying mm-hmm. to be better, consistently yeah. educating yourself, consistently trying to make improve everyone yeah. around you. Well, then, like in that world, like I've seen you from knowing you for you know, not terribly long, but like really, like I feel like you and I have had a deep connection and a deep friendship, like really quickly. But like, so like I looked at when we first chatted, it was like we walked through your life and we mm-hmm. looked at career and everything else. It's like in that space of career and life and everything else. What has been the biggest pivot that you've intentionally made mm-hmm. to now be here? Sure. Um, well, there there were several pivots. Um, the first big pivot was pivoting from 
um, graphic design into film. Mm. And that happened simply because I didn't know you could study film if you weren't in California. I didn't know that colleges had film programs. So um, I studied graphic design and I was a freelance graphic designer for several years. And it was just not, it was something that I could do, but I wasn't really enjoying it. And then I I found a film program here in Charlotte and I studied that and that put me on a traje trajectory mm. for filmmaking, which I quite loved. Um, but then what brought me here was um, very similar to what I just mentioned about like not, uh, going beyond what is just fine. Um, I was at, I have worked at several jobs where I've left because I know that we could be doing better and, um, and I didn't see that intention out of the rest of the people at that office. So it was like, I know like what we're doing is okay, but why do we not want it to be better? And, and can we make it better? And, um, that was always met with some resistance and some hesitance. And so I was like, well, this is not for me. It's arguably the reason I left college mm -hmm. because nobody wanted to be great. Everyone wanted to be great at something else. Mm. And I was going on a path where it was, this was the only thing that I, I mean, I don't want to say cared for, but it was the only thing that really mattered to me. So like, yeah, I get that. Well, I went to seven colleges. So, uh, if you're, if you want to know somebody who wants to be great, it's whoever goes to the most colleges. And that's a scientific fact. I can't agree with you more. Right. I mean, I went to three mm -hmm. and don't have a degree. <laughs> well, there you go. So, I mean, I think right now, if, if you said, like, what are you? I mm -hmm. think I'm, like, graduating f or maybe I'm becoming a junior. Sure. I'm in that world. So, it's like, I don't know where that sits. Mm -hmm. I don't know what transfers. I don't know. I mean, I can't figure it out. I'm obviously not smart enough to figure it out. Sure. Well, you didn't finish college. Exactly. So, yeah. That's why. So, um, all right. So, now, imagine you were leaving the seventh college. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So, you're pulling out. You can picture it. Picture, degree in the pocket. And you have the ability to take a big old marker, uh, spray paint, paintbrush, whatever, mm -hmm. and you're driving out of that college, and you see a big billboard. Yeah, billboard. It's sure. Empty. Yeah. What are you writing on it? Um. <clears throat> well, because I went to so many colleges, and I was never much of a school guy. Um, the day I left was like, it was like the happiest moment because I was like, oh, I never have to do this again. I never have to go to a class and, and study and learn. Because I went to so many schools, I was a, I was an older, you know, an older student. Um, you know, a lot of kids that were going to college were in their you know, 19, 20, 21. Um, so I was in my late twenties when I was finishing. So I valued a little bit more, but I still, I don't like taking tests. Don't want to do that anymore. So it's not very profound, but it would be something along the lines of like, um, you know, so long school, so long forever school, uh, which, which sucks because I do, I do really value education. Like, you know, I don't know what it's like now with the younger generation, but in my generation, it was like, if you cared about school and learning, you were a nerd. And that was mm. frowned upon in, you know, popular culture. Um, but I, now it's like, I wish I had I wish I had valued being smart earlier because it's such a, it's such a rare thing, smart people out in the wild. So, um, so it's very important to me now. Um, but yeah, tests, man. I just, maybe, maybe that should have been the name of this talk show. Smart people in the wild. Smart people in the wild. Man, that's, yeah, that's, that's good. That would have been good. Yeah. I wish we thought of that 10 minutes ago. Well, you should have, we should have done a pre-interview and then, uh, yeah. that makes sense. That makes, I mean, that would have been the smart thing to do. Yeah, that makes sense. So now, all right, so you rewrite the billboard, mm -hmm. So Long School, yeah. Asa La Vista. It's not a great message. Right, but what would it be now? You know, you look back, you know, 10, 15 mm -hmm. years, what would it be now? It would be like, go to school, um, <laughs> because I think not enough people are doing that. And, you know, I get asked a lot about, um, from younger photographers and videographers, should I go to film school? And that is a personal question that, you know, I can only give my my answer to, um, because I, I valued it and I got out of it what I put into it. So it meant a lot to me. So I was studying extra hard. I was doing extra, extra things. I was the president of the film club, nerd alert. And so like I, it was very important to me. So I got a lot out of it. And through that, I got a lot of, um, opportunities out of it. And I met a lot of people that have become, have become very influential and, uh, have helped me continue to grow, um, that I might not have got if I just used, you know, YouTube university to learn how to make films, right? I got a network of people that I can trust, that I can 
send my stuff to to get feedback and they will give me honest feedback and know that we're not all just chasing trends that we saw on YouTube. So I think go to school for whatever it is, even if it is just to um, get that well-rounded education and get that network of people that you can rely on as you move forward in your career. So now, I mean, I think I think lead perfectly lead into my next question. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, it's like you've, you, you know, it. you're here with me. Yeah. Um, the so as a creative, you know, I know you and I both believe in like having that creative group of people, having that conversation, mm -hmm. sparking creativity, collaboration, all those different things. But when you feel stuck as a creative, mm -hmm. because I know I get this question a lot, where it's like, as a creative, I'm stuck. I'm in my own way. I can't get out. I don't feel creative. I don't feel inspired. Like. What are the things that you do that get you out of that space? Yeah, um, I have to I have to get away from whatever it is that I'm stuck on. Mm -hmm. Like, um, you know, when it was when it was graphic design, I would um, put it put this this project away and go do something else. And then when I come back to it, I'm looking at it with fresh eyes. I'm looking at it with new perspective, and I'm able to see all the things that weren't working about it before. And that has transitioned into film and video as well. And it's you know. It is hard when you work in marketing or advertising where you know deadlines are very important. You don't always have the time to do that, but I have to I have to have the ability to get away from this thing that is causing me frustration or even just like, hey, I'm trying to write something that is f personal. Like I'm trying to write a, a, a short film script or something um, and it's just not coming to me. I get away from it for a little while. It's the shower principle, right? You have all these good ideas when you're in the shower and you're not thinking of the thing that you were supposed to be thinking about. Um, so when I'm doing something else, we at our old office had a ping pong table and you know, as, as loud and annoying as it might've been to some of our coworkers, um, it gave me an opportunity to focus on ping pong. And then when the game was over, I'm like, now I got it. Now I feel, now I feel like I can come back to this with a fresh perspective. I love that because it sets up a framework for when you see patterns or you see, you recognize certain aspects, you can go back to that and say, hey, this is where I know I operate really well in. So like even in that framework about getting out of, you know, creative quicksand, it's what's the framework of your life? Do you do certain things to set yourself up for if it's either an amazing day or, you know, an amazing time with friends or, you know, your girlfriend or whatever it is, like, is there certain actions framework I mean, we know the greats talk about it. Mm -hmm. Like, what is your framework? Or what, do you have a schedule? Or do you have things that pull and trigger and all these different things? I, I feel like my work gets better when I really think things out and I really plan. Um, I think that planning and pre-production are often very much overlooked in this world. Um, in my personal life, I, I want to have that mentality of like, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to make a schedule and I'm going to wake up early and I'm going to go to the gym and I'm going to whatever, whatever. Um, I definitely don't do that. I have no set schedule. I don't have a bedtime. I just like, maybe I'll go to sleep now or I'll go when I'm tired. Um, so yeah, my personal life is, is a lot less structured. Um, but I also don't do a lot. If I'm being honest, I don't go out a lot. I pretty much go home. I have nine pets. I go home and I play with my nine pets. And, uh, that's kind of, that's, that is like my me time. You know, a lot of people are like, Hey, well, after a long week, I just want to go out. I want to go, you know, do a thing or, or, you know, go hiking or go camping or go whatever. Um, I, I, I and also it's because I'm, I'm an introvert. Um, or maybe I'm that weird middle ground where it's like I'm an extroverted introvert, but like I, I personally recharge my batteries by just going home and being alone for a while. And I think that helps a ton because my partner, my girlfriend is a flight attendant. So she's often gone. And so when I'm home, I'm truly home by myself for a while. And then, you know, we miss each other and she comes home and we're home together. And then sometimes it's like, all right, when's your next trip? Um, <laughs> but, uh, but that helps, uh, you know, when I'm around people all day at work, it's like, I gotta, I gotta have some me time. Um, so that's how I sort of, um, that's not what your question was, but that's how I, uh, you know, energize myself and, um, and, and I don't need a structure for that, you know, cause it's just like, I'm just going to go home and maybe I'll play a video game. Maybe I'll whatever. It, it kind of is my, it kind of is my question, right? It's like, you know yourself well enough to know that you don't need the structure and that's like, that's awesome. But it's, but it is crucial and imperative in my work because I just can't, I can't wing it. Right. Because, and I think it's because I, I 
care about it and I want the level of quality to be so high that if I'm just, and, and sometimes we have had to wing it and sometimes that project turns out great, but I can't rely on that strategy working all the time. So I perhaps over prepare by drawing storyboards and, and shot listing and, you know, and maybe we feel hamstrung by that. Maybe we say like, you know, do we have room to be creative on set? And, and I, I try certainly in my filmmaking life, I try to say, this is just a framework. Let's try to follow this as closely as possible. But if we are struck by something in the moment, we can, you know, we can adapt. But I think, I think adapting to a plan is so much better than just saying, well, here we are. What do we do next? I can't, I can't do that. What's the old expression? Like the five P's, like piss poor performance leads to, um, no, uh, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to figure this out later. No, I don't know what it is. We're going to figure this yeah, out later. Okay. We're going to figure it out later. We'll drop it in the link below. Uh, failure to prepare is preparing to fail. I like that. That's another way of saying the same thing. But I like that. All right. So it's not five P's, but that's good. FT. We'll, we'll go, we'll go with that. Yeah. We'll figure that out okay. later. Smart people will figure that out so, later. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Um, what's the unusual habit or absurd thing that you just absolutely do on the regular? Absurd habit. Um, you know, like some people take, people call like taking cold showers an absurd mm -hmm, habit. Mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. you know, what is like the one thing that you're just like, this is like, everyone looks at me the other way or like, you know, gives me the head nod when I say I do this. Well, I'm, I'm like the most normal guy. So I don't do anything weird and no one will disagree with me about that. Um, no, I mean, honestly, like to be honest, the coffee thing freaks a lot of people out. They don't get it. And also I don't really drink. Um, I will, uh, on special occasions, I'll have, uh, you know, I'll have a cocktail or a, <laughs> or a, an, an old fashioned or a Moscow mule or something like that. But, um, I just, gr I grew up, um, you know what it is? I grew up really not liking who my friends were becoming when they were saying, when they were trying to be cool for other people. And I was like, I was watching them choke down beers and being like, this tastes so good. And I was like, oh my God, you're so annoying. Like, stop trying to be cool. Just be who you are, be yourself. And people will like that. And uh, that lost me a lot of friends. So, um, so I just, it, it never, it never sat right with me. And, um, and then by the time I did start when I was of drinking age and I was in college, I was just like, I don't like this. Why, why, why would I subject myself to more of this if I'm just not enjoying it and it doesn't taste good? So, um, I don't really drink that much. And uh, that's another thing that people are like, well, don't you want to just go home and unwind and have a beer? I'm like, nah, I don't, I don't drink in my yeah. own house. And I would rather eat my calories. So, <laughs> I mean, I would too. I mean, like I barely drink in my own house. Like if, like you said, I go out, I'm a celebratory drinker. It's, hey, we're out with friends and we're celebrating something like, you know, Patrick at our company is the chief celebration officer. Sure. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of times where he's like, hey, like, we got to get a beer because like this is cool and like this has happened. And it's I'm all on board for that. Well, his but, culture is like always drinking beer. Well, yeah, but he's a different morning, I mean, afternoon. Well, the other evening, thing, too, is yeah. as he drinks like PBRs and Bud Light, sure, I mean, that's just sure. water. Yeah. Like, sure. But it does it taste like beer. Kind of. Does it act like beer? Yes. Mm -hmm. But it's water. Yeah. So, I mean. Yeah, I wish I had a better answer. I mean, I know my girlfriend would for sure say, would have a dozen answers for this. Hmm. I just, um, I can't think of being on the spot. Those are the two, those are the two that I think people turn their heads the most at. Got it. All right, well then, you know, as we're going from arguably unusual habits, I would ask the question of, in the last, oh, I don't know, a couple years, what is the one thing you've purchased, like under $200, that has been the most impact life impacting purchase of the last few years well you know i did i adopted a dog hmm. and um that has impacted my life tremendously um i i don't i don't really buy a lot of stuff if i'm mm -hmm. being honest the yep. thing the thing i spend the most money on outside of just like my bills and my car um is like movies, you know, I have a collection, I've got like 600 and plus DVDs and Blu-rays. Um, and <laughs> which means I stay home a lot and watch them. Um, so other than that, I don't really buy a lot of stuff. I don't buy a lot of things that are just like, you know, whim purchases or whatever. Um, but I did, I did adopt a dog and that is another one of those things that, um, you know, my home life and getting away from, uh, from work, 
uh, just brings me so much joy and so much like, you know, it just de-stresses me. You know, they said there's like a scientific thing about like petting a dog, like lowers your stress levels. And uh, I, in the, in the two, two and a half years I had from my, when my last dog passed away to when I got Bentley, um, my stress levels were through the roof. And then once I got Bentley, it was like, uh, there's just that unconditional love that you get from a dog that you can't, you can't get anywhere else. And that I think, um, if we're considering that a purchase, I mean, I did technically purchase him uh, and all of his things, yep. but uh, that's the thing. That's the biggest thing that I've bought that um, that really, you know, impacted me. Good, I like that. So now, six hundred best boy, and we all know it. Oh, he's <clears throat> he's awesome. No shade to Taco. Taco's great. Yeah, but Bentley's Bentley's just better. <laughs> just objectively better. <laughs> so, <laughs> you talk about the DV- 600, 600 yeah, plus yeah. DVDs, right? Blu-rays, DVDs. If you were at home right now, mm-hmm. what is the one movie you're popping in? Like, if you don't have to come to work today and we say, hey, let's go home and watch a movie and yeah. Mike's picking, what's Mike picking? So I know a lot of people would think that I would choose Ghostbusters because Ghostbusters is one of my favorite movies. It, it is. And uh, it's great. It's, it's a classic. It's unbelievable. It's fantastic. Um, but I'm picking Jurassic Park. Okay. Seven days a week. Uh, Jurassic Park was a movie that I saw. I vividly remember seeing it in movie theaters in 1993 or 94, whatever it was. I was 10 or whatever. And I just said, I have to do that. I got to know how they did that. I got to know everything about how they made this movie. And then I want to do that. So it was like a movie that, and it, and it has not like, Sometimes even even in those movies that people have where they're like, this is my favorite movie. I can watch it all the time. There's parts that maybe you fast forward through or you don't pay attention to. I am locked and loaded to Jurassic Park every single time because it is a phenomenal movie. Uh, it hits all the right notes. It's beautiful. It's, you know, makes your heart race. It's just so good. Um, and again, it, it really set me up on a path of like wanting to do that for my career. Um, and then when I, uh, going back to an earlier question, when I found out that I could, it made me even more excited and it made that movie even more impactful. So how do you feel about the recent Jurassic Parks? I think they're, they're doing their best. Um, I don't like to disparage any filmmaker. I don't like to ever say, certainly not on a podcast or in a video um, that can be seen on the internet, I don't ever like to say that what you've made is bad. Because it's not bad. There are great things about both of those movies. Uh, I don't think they quite capture the magic that the original had, but also some of that could be just nostalgia. Some of that could just be me saying, you know, um, I love this because it made me feel a certain way back then, um, and these new ones don't make me feel that way, but that's not that's not their fault because my nieces and nephews, they love those new movies, right? And maybe those movies are, to them, what Jurassic Park, the original, is to me. I don't know. It's a good answer. I yeah. It's a great answer. <laughs> like it's a it's a really politically correct answer for a lot of different mm. things. Because look, I know how hard it is to make a film. Yeah. I I've never made a feature, so I can only imagine it's way harder to do that than a short film. But I know how hard it is. I know how impossible it is to make your vision come to life on screen. Um, and I don't want to um, assume what those directors' visions were and how twisted it got along the way because of studio, whatever, whatever. Um, but, you know, I think there are some really strong elements about it, um, but I think they are perhaps among the weakest of the franchise. Okay. I think it's a good answer. The stamp of approval. There you we know, go. Yeah. stamp of yep. approval. That's, that's, you know, we, get, we have it here. Uh, now, as we're talking film, movies, features, shorts, everything like that. If a viewer, listener at home is sitting back here wanting to get into the film space, wanting, I mean, watching YouTube University, um, maybe Littlefield University, but, you know, maybe we'll see. Streaming but, on YouTube now. You know, streaming out. on YouTube now. But anyways, uh, truly, like, what is the first step that you would recommend somebody to go into the space? Is it education? Is it trial and error? Is it an investment into a small camera system? Yeah. What is it? Honestly, it's all of those things, right? It is, you, you don't, the first, the first things I made were on my dad's Sony Handycam that you literally had to like put on your shoulder because yeah. there, was a v, there was a VHS tape inside of it. So terrible quality, um, but it got me out there. It got me saying, how do I want to shoot this? Where do I want to put the camera? How can I make this, you know, fun and interesting? Um, and it helped me learn about storytelling what order do I shoot this in? What order do I edit this in to make the most impact? I learned so much from just getting out there and playing around. It was fun and it was educational. Um, but I learned how to do it 
right. I learned the rules that I now know I can I can break if needed, but I learned the rules and I learned the fundamentals and I learned how to like make it look good and make it sound good. I learned that from school. Now, when I went to school, YouTube was not as prevalent. There are so many things that you can learn on YouTube and you might be able to make a one man band short film by yourself with the equipment that you have and the education you get straight from YouTube. Um, but I think, as I mentioned earlier, I think having that network of people that you have, that you went to school with is, you know, the people I went to school with have been the crew on every film I've made. And I wouldn't have a crew if I hadn't met them at school. Yeah, I mean, you're going to meet people on YouTube, but uh, comments are one thing. Sure. And, and how many of those people live in my area and want to come help out for free, you know? So, yeah. Now, as you talk about that crew following through, I mean, like you've had this crew now with you in like, let's call it in your world for 10 plus years. So you've made multiple shorts, you've made a ton of commercials, you've done a ton of work. Like what is the go-to aspect? Like if you're talking about making a short with your crew, with your team, you know, Littlefield Company, your team, it's from school. What is like the first thing and where does it start? Well, I think the, so what I have, what I've, what I really like about the crew that I have been using for my films is that uh, we have been working together for so long that we have a, a trust built in and we have a sort of a shared vision. Even if one of us wants to do something totally different and experimental um, and different from everything that we've done before, we've been doing it together so long that we just know kind of, I get what you're saying and I know what you're going with. And I'm, I'm here to help you. I trust you and I think this is going to be great and I want to be a part of that. Um, so I think trust is a huge thing and that's something that we, uh, our team developed very early on, um, which is very lucky because you don't always get that, is a, I know that if I can't be there and these guys are in charge of it or these girls are in charge of it, it's going to be great, right? And I also know that if I have a vision for this um, and I can explain it to them, and they get where I'm going, for, uh, what I'm going for, that they will be able to execute on it. And I don't have to, I don't have to handhold, and I don't have to do five jobs at once. Because on a film set, you need to be focusing on your job and not everyone else's job. So um, trust, I think, is where you, you know, having that vision, being able to uh, share that with your crew, and trusting that they will get it, and knowing that they trust you to not make something bad. Um, you know, because because. Even if you're just a crew member, your name is on that film. It's 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 yours too, and so you want it to be good. Makes sense. Now, yeah, I think that's one of like the very interesting parts of like from my world of like coming from golf to then photography to then starting a company. It's like I always looked at it as a team, and it's unique because in film, just like in golf, it's an individual sport. Like you handle your piece, but it acts as a team, and it's a really interesting dynamic. Um, and I've always found that fascinating coming from like team sports to then at that point, like film, because it's the same exact principle. Yeah. You can make a film by yourself, but, but it's way harder Good luck, and it's not going to necessarily be as good as if you trust professionals who are great at that thing to do that thing. And it's going to elevate your work. You know, I can, I, I know I can run a camera. I can point it at stuff. I can generally make it look good, but I also know that the people I work with are amazing at that and they're going to do it better than me. So let me let them do that. Let me tell them what I'm picturing and let them do great work. So now, as you're talking about letting people do their thing, do great work, I can do this. In the job that you have today, in the job that you're working for, do you feel you're doing what you're born to do? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, I don't think anyone was born to um, make marketing videos. Um, <laughs> but I will say that um, this is, Making making movies is is the thing that I know I was born into because uh, my brother has been involved in it his whole life. My grandfather was like an early pioneer of like live television, so he was in the industry. Um, so I know that like that's just we I've been doing it my whole life, and I know that's something that I want to get into. But breaking into Hollywood is very difficult, and making indie features is also very difficult because you have to have money and you have to have backers and you have to have time and you have to have all these things. And while I'm making that indie indie movie, I'm not making money to live and pay my rent, so I have to have a job. That and and if I have to have a job, I would rather have a job where I'm doing 
that thing that I want to get better at and that I want to do eventually, right? So we're making marketing videos. I push for, let's do some more, you know, cinematic stuff. Let's do some more narrative stuff. Let's do some more stuff where we're actually telling real stories. Every opportunity we get to do that is, is an opportunity for me to get closer to making films. And, you know, every commercial that we make that has a story that has characters and actors in it, it's a little film. So if, if I get to do that, I'm happy. Love that. I mean, and now it's leading into like what you're going to do in the future. So like as looking at the next step or, you know, you know, you look back at this point, 50 years from now, like what's the legacy you want to leave on the people around you? Yeah. I mean, I have a, I have, I have a sort of a Papa bear, baby bear legacy yep. uh, where my, my Papa bear legacy is I want to make a film that, um, that, someone watches when they're 10 years old and says, I have to do this with my life, right? That inspires someone to go out and pick up that camera and learn how to tell stories. Uh, the baby bear legacy of that is I just want to make, I want to make a film that I am proud of. And even if no one sees it, I made it, I'm proud of it. This is what I had envisioned my whole life. Um, and I think the people in my orbit will be, um, happy that I, that I achieved that goal. Even if again, I, it doesn't get, it doesn't get sold to Netflix and I don't become this, you know, famous director and I don't change lives. I did this thing. I'm happy with it and I can rest easy. I mean, I think the, the, the baby bear, uh, vision or legacy here is going to come to fruition. We're on really our quick. way, baby. Oh, we're absolutely there. Hell yeah. No question about it. So I'm excited to, you know, be a part of that journey with you. Cause it's not, you know, like we talked about earlier, it's not just your journey. It's the team's journey. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's everyone coming together to see, you know, Mike's film again. But the cool part about this is that we're, a lot of people are going to see it. And it's going to happen. That makes it even better. And, and I know, I know I couldn't do it on my own. So I'm eternally grateful for anyone that has a hand in making it come to reality. Awesome. Let's go do it. Great. Um, so as we're wrapping up here today, I think one of my favorite questions is, um, and I already I, I, answered the pizza question. Yeah, I did. You're right. Okay. But, I, but the, the other aspect of this is you feel like I, you're, I know where you're going to go with this answer. I know where you're going to go, but yeah, I mean, but I'm excited about it because I think there's a little thing up your sleeve that I don't know about yet. I haven't heard this story, but I feel like it's there. What is the last or the most unreasonably awesome thing that you've done? Yes, I know. Don't, See, I know it's going to be, a I, lot. I, I stay at home and I hang out with my nine <laughs> pets and I lot. watch movies. Yeah. But like, what, is there one thing that you're just like, you know what? That was just unreasonably awesome. Hmm. Like, you know, it was unlimited budget or, mm -hmm. Hey, I made something happen really easily or just like something just like sat back and said, damn, like that was just really cool. Unreasonably awesome thing that I have like made or just like been a participant in. I'll take either. Okay. Knowing you, I'll take either. Yeah. I might hold some other guests sure, accountable sure. to like what is like very, very specific, but you, I'll take either. Mm -hmm. And then let me further qualify. Keep going. Let's do this thing. Un oh, Corinne's back. Corinne's interrupting us. Oh, um, great. Way to go. I mean, that is that has been the mo of her life. Right. It's just consistent interruptions. <clears throat> um, you know, part of me wants to say that I won at Top Golf last night, but that's not unreasonably awesome. It's just awesome. Um, <laughs> uh, and then, oh yeah, so further qualification, unreasonably awesome, like the world would agree that that's unreasonably awesome no. or just for me, you like, like you sit back here and like Harder it, now. it hits like, or, or the world. I mean, again, sure. like it's like you sit back and you're like, all right, that was pretty darn cool. Um, Okay, this is not a cool answer. I'm going <laughs> to completely say that this is not a cool answer. Um, there, there was this, this company called Void VR. It's a virtual reality company. Now, I don't think that they are, exist right now, or they, they temporarily closed because of COVID, um, because it is, an exp it is a, an experience you have to go to an, an enclosed room isn't with strangers. is COVID fun? Uh, yeah, COVID. It's great, isn't it? Awesome. Yeah, super excited. Um, we but, are vaccinated, by the way, yes. to, to everyone out there. This is close to six feet, but we're... We're vexed. Uh, yeah. We're close. Um, Void VR. It it's a virtual reality experience, and it doesn't sound that cool. It is, I will say, unreasonably cool. Um, you go into this, you, you're, you're wearing a, a, a backpack and a whole thing here and a headset, so you can't see anything other than the, the screen. Um, 
but you're in this like essentially like black room that has you know tracking dots all over it, and um, they have different different themes that you can um, different stories that you can play through. So uh, at first it was like just kind of basic themes, but now it's like movies. You can do mm. like an Avengers one, and you can do a um, a jungle or what's the uh, Jumanji? You tell know, me, Jumanji tell thing. me there was a Ghostbusters. There's a Ghostbusters one. one. All right, that makes Obviously. sense. Obviously, this is this is yes. now tracking. Um, and so yeah, you 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 put the headset on, you go into this room, and then suddenly like the screen turns into the room that you're in. It's not just a dark room. It's a you know New York City apartment, and you can see things, and you can touch. You can see your own hands, and you can reach out, and you can touch things. And your backpack, of course, comes with a little gun. Um, and uh, you know, if I reach out and there's a doorknob there, I can actually turn that doorknob. I'm seeing a virtual hand turning this doorknob, and I'm going through this door, and I have no idea what I'm actually stepping on. Uh, the, the Ghostbusters one, it was like you go outside on some scaffolding outside of a New York City high-rise, and it's like they have like fans blowing wind at you, so you feel like you're cool. up really high. And the scaffolding sounds shaky, so I'm like, oh, that's shaky, and I'm shaking now, and I'm terrified. <laughs> Uh, and yeah, it was just so cool. You get, to, I got to bust ghosts. Uh, they had the big stay puff marshmallow man. And then when you cooked him, they had the smell of roasted marshmallows pumped into the room. Um, it is so much fun. The Jumanji one was hilarious and fun there. When void VR comes back, I cannot recommend it enough. It's like $35. The whole experience is like 15, 20 minutes long. Um, it is worth every penny. That was unreasonably cool. Now I haven't done it in like two years because of COVID, but, um, that was that was the last thing that I was grinning from ear to ear, uh, having had this experience, and I was like, "That was so damn cool." Okay, good answer. Okay, I like that. All right, I like that a lot. Good answer. I'm all in. Um, so most people know that I barely read. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Very, I mean, let's just be real. R- book a year. Mm, maybe I'm getting a little more than that right now, but that's about it. More than me. Well, good. Well, books are for nerds, so. I would agree. I mean, yeah, but I mean, you go to seven colleges. <laughs> That's true. I am, you know? I am a nerd. I mean, you're, you're an old student. I, I mean, you were president learned of the film club. I, you got to saying, I mean, like. You got to read and do the that. The math adds up. Mm-hmm. So if you were going to recommend a book to put in my library, yeah. what book are you putting in my library? Save the Cat. It is a screenwriting book. It's very uh, inexpensive. It's like sixteen dollars on um, Amazon. Okay. And uh, I have a copy of it, and I have a copy of the sequel book, um, "Save the Cat Goes to the Movies." It is uh, the the save. The, it, it's basically a beat sheet for how to write a feature film. Oh, um, cool. And it breaks movies down into like fifteen or sixteen beats, and it tells you where in the screenplay you should be having this beat. So by page ten, you need to have introduced the main characters and whatever, whatever, um, and. The, the sequel book, Save Cat Goes to the Movies, shows you a whole bunch of famous movies that have essentially used this exact same template. Now, when you hear template, you think, well, then you can't do anything original. Those movies are wildly different. It's like Alien and like Blank Check from 1991 really? or whatever. Yeah, they have the same exact... Can we also talk about Blank Check for a second? Yeah. Okay, because I'm, it's, it was a million dollar check, I believe. Well, it was a blank check, and then he... He wrote a million dollars. Sure, yeah. He lived in a multi-million dollar home. Yeah. With multi-million dollar Mm -hmm. worth of toys. Sure, yeah. It's not super realistic, yeah. Why didn't they just put 10 million on the check? Mm -hmm. I don't get it. Well, he was a dumb kid, you know? No, but I'm saying, like, as you wrote the movie... Right. If I'm writing the movie... I'm going to write $10 million, million, so it's a little more realistic. Yeah, but he's a kid. I don't want to be greedy. I'm already taking a million dollars, you know? Yeah, but he like didn't he get like a Ferrari? And didn't he have like a butler it's and a been, limo? It's been a while since I've seen Blink Check. It's not among my collection. That's a surprise. Yeah. That's a surprise. I we're gonna own everything. <laughs> Six hundred and it's not in it? Yeah. All right. Well, we're gonna change that. Christmas is coming up. Sure. Yeah. Maybe maybe it's in If you can find it on Blu-ray, you let me know. Okay, got it. Okay. All right. So now, uh, Mike, as we're wrapping up today, it's like we're looking at what's next. Mm-hmm. So what's next for you? What are the goals you're going after? Yeah. You know, 2022 is like here. It's like ready for hopefully a less mm-hmm. COVID infected year. Um, you know, what do you get in touch with or what are you going after? Well, a couple things. I would like to be able to travel more, um, although my flight benefits have been revoked for and that's a story for another day. Um, I'm not like on the no fly list, but I'll get into it later. Um, but I want to be able to travel more. Uh, with my girlfriend, who again, who's a flight attendant, and so uh, that's a big goal of mine. Yep. Um, and uh, I want to, I want to, I want to start working on a feature film, 
and I want to continue to do work that we are proud of. Um, in, in the marketing world, you're going to have to do work that is whatever. It's not the most exciting thing. It's not the most creative thing. It's not creatively fulfilling. But even if it is a small, quick turn, run and gun shoot that, you know, is for social media, if we can do it and say, that actually turned out pretty good. Like, I'm, I'm happy with that. That That's all I care about. You know, I, I obviously I'm going to always push for bigger. I'm always going to push for, you know, more storytelling. But uh, as long as we can, as long as we aren't saying like, it's fine. Like that, I think is the, that is the death of a creative person. That's eh, fine. Right. Uh, as long as we're saying I'm happy with that, then, um, then I'm good. I like that answer. So now uh, as we wrap up today, you said earlier that you're kind of like this, like right between like introvert, extrovert, but way more of an introvert. You refuel by introversion. Yeah. Uh, how do people get in touch with you? How do they connect with you? How do they see your stuff? How do they, sure. um, I don't want to say like learn and pick your brain, but like if somebody wanted to chat about features or films mm-hmm, or mm-hmm. join the crew, like how are they getting in touch with you? Sure. Well, um, I have a website uh, and it's uh, MikeReda.com, R-E-D-A. And I've got all my films there, all my, uh, all the short films that I've made, all the, you know, videos that I've done over the years. Um, so that's a good way to find me. And um, I'm on every social media app at, at, the Mike Rita, and because there's only one, there's a lot, and um, yeah, but there's only one. That and matters. I couldn't, I didn't get to Mike Rita in time, so I had to settle for the Mike Rita. Isn't so it anyway, a little more distinguished though? I guess, but I would have rather had just had Mike Rita. All right, I respect anyway. that. So yeah, at the Mike Rita, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, etc. Cool. All right. Well, Mike, thank you for being here today. Thanks, Thanks for, for hanging out me. and not drinking coffee with me. You know, this would. is uh, you know a coffee on the go podcast mm-hmm, or mm-hmm. talk show. But, um, you know, again, it's gross bean water, as yep. you call it. It's bad. Or dirt water. Dirt water. Dirt yeah, water. That's what you call way it. Way worse. I would drink bean water. <laughs> oh, God, no, I wouldn't. That's a test. Yeah. That's a test. And for a story around the flying miles uh-huh. and air miles, maybe that's, maybe that's the next talk show. Maybe sure. that's where we go next. We go up in the air together. Mm-hmm. We collect we'll some see. bean water. We'll see and we do the talk show on. and have everyone be upset with us. Sounds good. All right, great. Mike, thanks for being here. Thanks for and uh, we'll talk soon about it. Gotcha that. Thanks for listening.